Morning, everyone. I want to welcome you. If you're joining us for the first time, I pray that you, you, we make you feel at home. And I pray that you will experience the Lord in a special way this morning. Uh, just a few words of announcements I would like to announce to you. Okay, so in the coming weeks, there's a lot of stuff kind of uh, going on. So at the very last week of this month and the beginning of April, it actually begins at the end of this month, we are going completely live up here in the platform. Our Sunday school, we want our Sunday school completely up and running here in the church. Um, and then April, the first Sunday of April, which I believe is April the 4th, we will be back in church. Yay, fool. Yay. Yay. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And, you know, and God is doing great things among us. You know, we, we're having families being joined together. We're exciting, exciting days are ahead. And I just want to let you know that our church family is continuing to grow. Although there are some seats empty right now is because people are viewing from home. But I want to assure you that once we get back in here, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful, great time of worship with our brothers and sisters that we might have not seen in a while. People are receiving their vaccinations. So, you know, people are starting to come out of their houses, out of their, their closets and into the church. Amen. Amen. And we're excited about that. Well, having said that, I want to tell you that my heart right now is full. Uh, we have been praying to God for, you know, newcomers and, 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 you know, and people to come and be part of the church. And, and God has, has sent us some people. And so we are excited about that. Uh, right now, though, before we get started, I want to encourage you by letting you know that we have two new members that are going to be coming into the church this morning. I just said that we are having two more church members coming into the church this morning. That's exciting. You know, that's exciting for me. Um, and so I hope it's exciting for those that are uh, joining the church as well. So may I have Glenda and Eric come forward, Glenda Harms, and then Eric Steck. Now, let me just share to you, with you just a little bit about Glenda. Uh, Glenda... Uh, for a while, came to me, and she we, we started a conversation, and she began to uh, really want to serve the Lord in, in, in some way, shape, or form. And so, uh, and so I needed a kind of like a, a part-time secretary, a volunteer secretary. So she volunteered, and she has helped me in many ways. You know, she records, answers the phones, writes, you know, little things, little memos, things here and there that kind of occupy my time that, you know, I can pass on to somebody else to do. And she's done a great job of that. And since, and since you know, she, she's been doing that, I've just seen her grow. I have seen her blossom spiritually. I'm not physically, I'm spiritually and it's a difference because I want to tell you something. When someone experiences the joy of the Lord in their heart, they begin to shine. They smile more. You know, and it's not a fake smile because, you know, you, you can tell a fake smile from a real smile, right? Someone who's really experiencing the joy of the Lord and those that are pretending to experience it, you can almost like tell. And I, and, and I want to share with you that she is experiencing the joy of the Lord in her life. And one of the things that I have always said to her when we walked in, I said, what do we get to do today? We get to serve the Lord. We get to serve the Lord. And then Eric, this young man uh, started coming to church here by the way of Mark and Justin Tapman. And, and, and then when I met Eric, I knew that this kid, this guy, this young man was on fire for the Lord. He loves Jesus, friends. And you are in for a treat today because today he's going to share his heart with us of how God came to him and how he experienced God in his life. And so I'm excited to hear how, and I'm excited for you because you get to hear what God has done in his life. And Eric and I, we have spent some quality time together. 
and I'm teaching this young man how to do exegesis, an exegetical paper. Those that don't know what an exegetical paper is, you bring out the truth out of the, out of the text. Everything, the historical content, you know, who the author is, all the, everything that, that, that envelops the story that is found in the Bible. And this young man has been eating up the Bible like I've never seen anyone eat the Bible up before. This kid is on fire for God. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, he, he kind of reminds me of me when I first started, you know, serving the Lord. And he just wants to serve the Lord. So with that said, Eric, would you stand over here, please? Right there. No, just right there. Yeah, there you go. Right there. All right. So before we get started, I want to do the ceremony of membership. And friends, there are privileges and blessings that we find in association together in the church of Jesus Christ. And such privileges that we experience are sacred and precious. There is such a hollowed fellowship as cannot otherwise be known. There is such helpfulness of with brotherly love, watch, and care, with great counsel also to be found in the church, in, of, in this church, CFC Church. There is godly care, like I said, of the pastor with teaching of the word and instruction of the word and the helpful inspiration of corporate worship. There is a cooperation in service accomplishing that which cannot otherwise be done without the body of Christ. Without us, there is no church. Without you and me in this building, this building is just, it's not a church, it's an empty building. That's all it is. But with us in it, we make the church. And with that, my friends, comes a sweet, sweet fellowship that cannot be found, not in this world, not at, not at the movies, not at the nightclub, not at the bar, not at your neighbor's house, not at the, your relative's house, not at mom and dad's house, but in the house of the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. It is a privilege that we have that we experience these wonderful things when we get to see one another and say, Hi, Brother Don. How are you? Good to see you this morning. And Brother Don says, Buenos dias, Pastor. And it's a wonderful feeling. So with that said, um, I'm going to turn now to, to you, my sister in, in Christ. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that he has saved you from your sins and he has given you a right to have a, a place in his kingdom in heaven? I do. Do you believe that God is wanting to use you for his kingdom and for your own good and for the good of the brothers and sisters in the church? If so, say, I do. I do. Amen. So, desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you covenant to give yourself to fellowship and work of God in connection with it, with your services, which is your time, treasures, and talent? Now, let me pause with you here. Uh, time. Are you willing to spend time in the Word of God? Daily reading in scriptures. Spend time in the church, fellowshipping with your brothers in the Lord. Are you willing to give of your tithe, of your offerings, of the things that God has given to you to help the church move the ministries forward? And do you, and do you, of your talents, do you give of your talents? Well, if you sing, but I know that you're a great secretary, so you're doing that already. So with that, say, I do. All right. Amen. 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 So now I turn to you. Now to you, I'm going to address you a little different than her. Because I know that you have a call in your life. I know that you're hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that you want to mature and grow up in his ways. I know that you know that I know that you know that I know that we both know 
that there comes a great responsibility when it comes to the administering of God's word. You got to study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you understand that, that by teaching good sound doctrine, you not only save yourself, but those that hear the gospel that is preached from the lips and that comes out of your heart? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you endeavor now to be part of a church, to give yourself wholly to the ministering of God's word, to the edification of the brothers and sisters in Christ, to the helping and moving the church forward and the kingdom of God forward? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you endeavor to give of your tithes and offerings to the church, to, for the, not to the church, to God, for the furtherance of his kingdom? Say, I do. I do. All right. With that, I turn now to you, church. Because you see, this walk, this, this covenantal relationship that we're getting into, that they're walking into, that they want to be part of, is not a one-way thing. It's a, it's a two-way street here. You see, because... Our brothers and sisters, there's going to come a time in their walk when they feel feeble, weak, and they feel like they can't go on anymore. And this is where the church comes in. We, brothers and sisters, we step in and say, can I help you? Can I be there for you? Can I pray for you? What can I do to uplift you? When you see your brother and your sister in Christ down in spirit, are you willing, church, to step up and encourage them, and love them, and let them know that they're important not only to God, but to you in the church. If so, say we do. We do. Amen. My sister, Glinda, I welcome you into the church of the Nazarene. Eric, my brother in the Lord, you are now a full member of the Church of the Nazarene, and I look forward to working with you and seeing you grow in the ways of the Lord. Amen. You may be, you may be seated. You may be seated. With that said, we're going to continue to move forward as we have a wonderful service ahead of us here and I would like to uh, what I like to for us to, when you walked in you all received should have received your communion cup if you do not have one please raise your hand and we will make sure that you get one okay everyone has received one all right so with that said for what I received from the Lord I also pass on to you the Lord Jesus Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which, for you, which is given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and saying, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. So with that said, let us pray for the elements. Father, I just pray that you bless these elements, Lord, that you would, Lord, Father God, look into our hearts, Lord, Father. And Lord, and I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, and reveal more of yourself to us. Father, for we want to be obedient unto you. We want to do these things, Lord, because we remember the bread is your body that was given up for us on Calvary, which was broken and which was beaten and flogged. And this grape juice represents your blood, which was shed for us for the remission of sin. Lord, we want to stop right now and just say thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us. That while we were yet sinners, you were willing to die for us. 
and give your body for us so that we may have a way to the Father. For that, Lord, we give you praise and we thank you. And we do this in remembrance of you. Take the bread and partake. Take the juice and drink in remembrance of our Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We have a volunteer that's coming around that's going to be picking up these little things right here. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let's stand. Oh, thank you. I'm getting a signal. I need to unmask. Let's stand and worship the Lord, shall we? chance to participate in worship. Whether you know these songs or not, I would challenge you to make a joyful noise to the Lord in your spirit. This next song is a magnificent song of the church, and it talks about the awe that it fills us with, his sacrifice and the relationship we can have, and can it be.
promised you the third wise men and uh, that song is really appropriate based on this for the third wise man was a guy by the name of Jim Jim's last name was Wallace Jim was a detective in Los Angeles County in the United States if you watch much TV um, you may see Jim because he has been on TV and some of those detective programs more than any other uh, detective in the country. He's a cold case detective. He started out working in LA, eventually went into homicide and became solving, went on to solve cold case detective. Now Jim, Jim was an atheist. Um, he had nothing to do with God and there wasn't much of God in his life. His dad was also a police officer in LA just like Jim and uh, for the first 35 years, Jim was an atheist. And his wife one day said, let's go to church. So Jim, wanting to help his marriage, said, sure, we can go to church. I don't really care. I can listen to the pastor go on, and my life is just fine. While there, the pastor began to speak of Jesus. And Jim said, huh, if Jesus is the smartest guy who ever lived, maybe there's something I can learn that will help me live a better life or help my marriage. So he began to, live, to read the Bible and the Gospels. And Jim, as he began to read the Gospels, as a cold case detective, said, you know, the more I read, it came to me that these are just like my eyewitnesses. He said, they are not exactly the same. They don't have all the details saying exactly the same thing. He said, this rings true. And he continued to study, not just for a week or a month, but for the next nine months, he read through. And he decided, well, let's put the Gospels and the Gospel writers to the test that we put people through in legal courts. Are they reliable? And so the first test that he'll talk about that you put witnesses through if you're on a jury is, were they there? Did they see what they said they saw? And the gospel writers checked that box. And the next test they put them through is, can they be corroborated? Are there outside sources that say the same thing? There was this guy, Jesus, and people said he did amazing things, and he died on, and yeah, that can be corroborated. There are people who had nothing to do with Jesus and outside sources that corroborate that in historical documents, just like his cold cases. And the third test you put witnesses through, his shares, is did they have something to gain to make them lie or deceive? And the three reasons 
they'll gladly tell you that people tend to commit crimes or cheat or lie are power, sex, and money. And he said, well, did the gospel writers get any of those things from what they, no, not a penny, not one consort, not any power. In fact, they were thrown in jail. And the final test that he says you put witnesses through is do they change their story over time? And I think you know that the gospel writers, the tradition is, and we have pretty sound evidence for a number of them, that they went to their death saying exactly what they always said. And he said, as I went through this and just applied cold case skills to this, I became convinced that Christianity was true. And he became a Christian after months of study. So we've been through three different approaches. The approach of science and astronomy, the approach of the study of history and archaeology, and the approach of a cold case detective who applies forensic skills to the study of the case of Christ. And all three of these folks went from not believing to accepting Jesus as their savior. So remember, this is not to, to overawe you with their power or even their journey, but it's to challenge. We as Christians have nothing to fear. We believe in the truth. We don't have to get mad. We don't have to get angry. We don't even have to win. We just have to stand with our Savior. And the Spirit is faithful to lead those who are seeking him. Let's bless the Lord, shall we? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new these lower parts. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. There you go. Oh my soul. Worship his hold. Thank you. Let's praise him. Sing like never before. Oh my soul. I'll worship his hold.
Spirit will praise Him. And we'll just be starting. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never. As we prepare for prayer, it's a song that has uh, some personal significance in my family. Um, you see, about a long time ago now, some of you remember those days, there was a pharmacist in uh, Champaign, Urbana, who led singing in a church of the Nazarene. And he would at times sing songs, and that uh, that pharmacist was my biologic dad. And um, he sang this song, this next song is called Great is Thy Faithfulness. And he sang that as a special in church all those years ago and went out and on his way to work that week, he hit a patch of ice going from Tolono up here to Champaign and slid off the road and struck another car and was killed instantly. This was the last song solo that he ever sang. And you think, wow, Phil, that's really depressing. Why would you tell such a maudlin story? But as I look at this song and as you sing it with me, um, I can't think of a song I'd rather sing my very last song. For it is our testimony of faithfulness to our God. Let's sing of his faithfulness, shall we?
bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand besides. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is our heads. Father, we give you praise. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You're faithful, Lord. Even when we fall short, you're faithful. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning I said that you are in for a treat. In a moment, I'm going to ask a young man to come up here and share a little bit of what God has been doing in his life. You know, um, but before I bring him up, I just want to share something with you. You know, each and every one of us, we all have a story to tell. Each and every one of us, we have a story to tell. A story that tells others who we are. A story that tells others where we come from, who our family members are. What we believe, why believe it, why we believe it. We all have a story to tell. And, and the way we tell a story is, you know, sometimes when we tell a story, when we are excited about what has happened to us, who we are, where we come from, who our family members are. It, 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 it brings people in. It, it draws people in. Like you get people's attention. People start to listen to you, especially when you're excited about it, right? When you're really excited about telling your story and people start to listen to you, and then especially everybody loves a story that not only has a plot and a punchline, right? Every story has that. And the same is true with our testimony. We all have a testimony. If you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a testimony. A testimony that tells of the wonderful things that God has done for you. It also tells the story of where you've been, who you were before you came to know Jesus Christ, the things that you have done, and the things that Jesus Christ, God Almighty, has rescued you from. We have a testimony, and we share our testimony. And some testimonies are very, you know, dynamic. Uh, very powerful. They paint a, a strong imagery for some people, especially when I hear about the Apostle Paul's Damascus Road experience. It grips me because I had a similar experience like that. And God, test, God, when He grabbed me, He gave me, and I gave my life to Him. I, now I have a story to tell people as to how God came into my life as to how God changed me, as to how God saved me, as to how God transformed my life. I guarantee you, friends, right now, if I had a picture of me, what I looked like back in 1985, you'd probably say, no way is this guy a pastor. No way is that you. You'd probably see me leaning a little back like this a little more and say, what's up, Holmes? <laughs> my, my language would be a little different. What's happening, dude? 
But you see, when God changes your heart, he not only changes your life, he, not only, he changes your, the way you think, the way you speak, and the way you walk. He changes your life. And that's a beautiful thing. And people, it's a beautiful thing because people want to hear your testimony. And we hear testimonies, right? We hear tes- of many testimonies. We hear of testimonies of God in song. We hear the testimonies of God in our prayer life and how we pray for others and for ourselves. We hear test, you know, we have a testimony of how, uh, how of God in our life and our obedience towards God. You know, when you're obedient to God, you're testifying about God. You're testifying of how wonderful you how wonderful God is and how reverent he should be looked at. Our obedience speaks. Louder than words. We testify of God through our influences. How we influence others. What others say about us. That guy is a good guy. He's the real deal. This person, she is a loving lady. Oh, bless her heart. She's so full of love. And we speak of God's eternal eternal love as well. Through our testimony. And so this morning I want to give that opportunity for a gentleman, this young man who just came into church. Would you come up, Eric, please? And I want you to hear his testimony. And I hope it moves you. Because it moved us on Wednesday night when we were hearing it. We didn't want him to stop, but I had to tell him to stop because I don't want him to ruin it. You're going to tell people all about your testimony and, uh, and no, no, I want to save that for Sunday. So did you, we have a microphone have a up microphone. here. You got a microphone? Yep. All right. All right. So with that said, Eric, tell us about God, how, what God has done for you. Can everybody hear me okay? Wonderful. Oh, man. I'm just, uh, God is a wonderful God. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> That's right. So this story I'm about to tell you is how God worked with me, and uh, well, here, I'll just let the uh, story describe itself. I'm very, very excited to, to speak it to you. So, when I was younger, my parents were divorced. But during the week and every other weekend, I lived with my dad. On the weekends, I was not with my dad. I stayed with my mom. I remember being so excited. Ex- yeah. I remember being so excited to stay with my mom because it meant that I didn't have to go to church on Sundays. The weekends I spent with my dad, he would make my sister and I attend Grace Baptist Church in Muhammad. Sometimes my grandmother, my dad's mom, would accompany us to church. Fast forward a few years, about 13 or 14 years. There was an instance once while I was in my bedroom, and something in my mind told me to throw away a CD from a band known as Lamb of God. Put shortly, the name of the band does not reflect the type of music they represent. I remember not wanting to throw away the album, but eventually I did. Later that night, or sometime after, I met up with my friend Justin Tatman, and I explained to him what happened and how God was talking to me. Remember that, Justin? (laughs) A few days or weeks passed, and I returned to however I was living life previously. After throwing out that CD, to the best of my memory, I have not listened to a Lamb of God song and only previously mentioned it to my boss at work right before I became a Christian. Fast forward again a few years. The woman I am married to now, when we, when we were dating, moved into an apartment together. One day I ran into an article, or was curious about an article, regarding being married in heaven. I deeply cared for my girlfriend during that time, and to this day I deeply love my wife. The Bible says in Luke 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 34 and 35, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. The crazy thing about this is I did not even read that Bible passage. I read someone paraphrasing that verse and it really upset me. I felt as if my heart was broken into pieces. After that, I just like, eh, eh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want, I don't really want nothing to do with Christianity. I still held some Christian beliefs, but I did not consider myself, my Christian, myself a Christian, even though I never acted, talked, lived, or accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. There's a difference between knowing who Jesus is and accepting who Jesus is in your heart. Huge difference. 
A few more years had passed, and one day I picked up a small leather-bound Bible that my grandmother gave me, and it was dated 2004, just a little bit larger than this Bible right here. I read a little of Genesis, and I put it back in my closet. One day on my lunch break while I was in Paxton, I, res I decided to have lunch at a uh, place called Just Hamburgers. While waiting in line, there was a bulletin board and a piece of paper attached to it. Written on it was uh, the verse Romans 10.9, which is actually one of my uh, own personal uh, Bible verses, favorite Bible verses. And that Bible verse goes, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that a great verse? I love that verse. A few more months had passed, and I picked up that little Bible again, and I wanted to read more of it. It was around June or July 2020, and I remember trying to read a little bit of it each day before I went to work, and sometimes I would read it while laying in bed. I worked for an office delivery company, and God blessed me with the ability to listen to the radio for hours each workday. He let me discover WGNN Good News Radio 1025. I then came across a YouTube channel by the name of Bible Project. What they do is they animate and explain the book of the Bible very clearly and give the message behind it simplified. I still watch them occasionally to this day, and their team is very, very talented. After the first video, I became hooked, and I wanted to learn more about the Bible. This was the beginning of my hunger for the Word. Days and weeks began to pass, and I had an appetite for the Word of God that just seemed though it could not be sated. Searching YouTube, I, I looked for more Bible content. I came across a video titled, Can I Lose My Salvation? Naturally. I was curious about it and began to watch it. Halfway through, the preacher talking, and it said, a guy came up to me and said, I was once a Christian, but I'm not anymore. And the pastor said to the man, get away from me. There's nothing more I can do for you. What he had said completely ravaged me to my core. I remember getting up out of my chair, walking into my fiance's office, and thinking I, I, I was doomed. All the blood had rushed from my face to my toes, and my heart sank to my ankles, and I turned as pale as a ghost. But why did that bother me so much? Why did it mess me up so bad? Because some time ago, I told a coworker that I was once a Christian, but I was no longer, I was no longer part of it. Anxiety, as though I have never felt before, gripped my innards. I couldn't eat anything. My body was so weak, and all I wanted to do was sleep. I was, it was so bad that I had to call and work sick. Early the next day, around 7.30 in the morning, I, I got on my phone. I Googled a church. It was, a, it was Bible Baptist uh, down the road there. And um, I, I just went to a, 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 a Baptist church because that's what I knew when I was growing up. I, I just I had to find something. So I called the first church on it, and uh, Pastor Mark Smith at Bible Baptist Church down the road uh, from this church, I, I asked him for help. I was desperate. I needed to get this straightened out immediately. He agreed to meet with me. In 30 minutes, he helped me with my question and read scripture regarding the topic of salvation. Uh, I, I began to feel better, but once I got home, the anxiety began to sit in and uh, set in again, and I couldn't shake it. I prayed and prayed for God to remove this anguish from me, but the only thing that relieved my pain was going to sleep. I was exhausted from the stress. After four days had passed, I sat on the edge of my bed crying my eyes out, and to God in a desperation prayer, I asked for forgiveness of my sins, and I asked Christ to just please come. I need you as a Savior, Lord Jesus. Please come into my heart. And right then and there, with that prayer, something around my heart, it began to release the pressure of all my sins and everything that I did wrong. It just had gone away. I believe God put that storm in my life to get me on the right path. Just as he needed the storm, and just as he used the storm in Jonah's story to put him back on the right path. Thankfully, I didn't get eaten by a giant fish. God taught me that studying the Bible, praying, going to church, and even having a few Christian beliefs are good. That, is, that does not bring salvation. Only by the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior will salvation be granted. I began to tell people that I became saved. My old lifestyle was gone forever. For it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new crea uh, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. The many sins of my life were gone, now forgiven. And I had the power to repent them through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! It was then I was baptized and led here by God through a series of events to be introduced to Pastor Juan and given many opportunities to serve the Lord. And now he is now, he is now um, uh, discipling me, and he, he, I am now a member of this church today. I, I, was, I was up here, I was so happy, I couldn't sit still, that, I have, that God has put these opportunities in my life. I'd like to close out this testimony with a message to new Christians like myself 
and some of the even the seasoned Christians as well. The enemy, Satan, the devil, the adversary, whatever you choose to call him, will do everything in his power to try to trip you up. He will put thoughts in your head saying, you're not good enough, or a lie, God doesn't love you, or you're not really saved. Do not listen to him. Jesus himself says that in John 8, 44, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. I'm going to end this out in the wise words of the late great American theologian J. Vernon McGee. May God richly bless you, my beloved. Um, this guy's on fire for God, man. And he reminds me of me when I first started out. I was eating up the Bible. I couldn't sleep. One Saturday afternoon, I sat there on my desk reading and studying and writing notes, looking at my concordance, going back and forth. Eight hours had passed by, and I, and I didn't even, they just went like that. Does it seem like that for you? <laughs> when you love God, you just, time just, time is, you don't care about time. You just want to be with the Lord in the word. I believe with all my heart that this young man has a wonderful call in his life. And I'm here to walk with him, to encourage him, to support him. And as we continue to watch this young man grow, I pray that it sets some of us on fire. Because let me tell you also, church, that we are also called to study the word daily, to testify and tell people of what God has done for us. We all have a testimony, and you have to testify of Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us, he says, if you are ashamed of me, I too will be ashamed of you when you come into the presence of my Father and his angels. And then I will turn to you and say, away from me, I know you not, you worker of inequity. If you are ashamed of speaking about Jesus, your Savior, in public, at your workplace, at the store, or on the phone, or whatever, whoever it is that you're talking to, guess what, friends? The Bible is true. The Bible is true. You will find yourself like this. Lord, Lord. Lord, I went to church. Lord, I read the Bible. Lord, and he'll say, who are you? Who are you? I don't know you. As a matter of fact, I'm nowhere in your heart. The only thing in your heart is your car, your job, your lifestyle, you. It's all about you. You're the only thing in your heart because I am not sitting on the throne of your heart. You are. Your friends are. Your career is. And on that day, and trust me, friends, trust you, me, when I say this, that there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I caution you very, I caution you right now, if you're listening to my words, I ask you to heed to these words of instruction. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I'm imploring you, that means I'm begging you to turn to Jesus and give your life to Jesus because there is a hell to shun and there is a heaven to gain. And unless you have Jesus Christ in your life, there is no way you are going to enter the kingdom of God. There is no way because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And without him, you cannot enter the kingdom of God.
There is coming a day. There is coming a day where God will give, we will all stand before the throne of God and you'll say, what have you done with my son? Am I first or am I last on your list of things to do in your life? Because, you know, Scripture says that he is Alpha, the Omega. And that's the way it should be in our lives. He should be the Alpha and the Omega. The very first thing in our life and the very last thing in our life. He's Alpha, the Omega. The beginning, the end. He is life. Life. And unless we have Jesus Christ, we will not have life. We will certainly inherit death in the fiery flames of hell. God help us. God, God help them that don't know Christ. And friends, the only way that people get to know about Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said, how will they know if they're not told? How will they know if they're not told? How would your friends and your family members know if you do not tell them about Jesus Christ and have the boldness to look them in the face and say, you know what, you're playing with fire, you're going down the wrong road, and soon and very soon you're going to regret it. God help you that you should die right now in your sin. Because without Christ, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this young man just told you how miserable he was, how sin sick he was, how terrible, and how, man, this guy couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. He was tossing and churning. He was sensing the fires of hell underneath his feet, burning him up. That caused him to say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. They, uh, not too long ago, I like you standing there. Just stay there. <laughs> no. Not too long ago, I heard someone say, there's nobody preaches about hell anymore. It's almost like preachers are afraid to offend the church members because they mean, you know, you preach on hell too much, pastor. Well, there's, you know, there's a reason for it because I don't want you to go there. Because it's real. It's real. It's a real place. It's real. It's a real place. And God did not create hell for you. He created it for Satan and his angels who rebelled against God. But, but he also is a just God and a righteous God and a holy God that he will punish those who do not turn to him and say, Lord, forgive me for what I have done. Please, Lord, forgive me. And I can assure you, just like my brother here has shared, the day we do that, he will forgive us. He will forgive us. He will apply grace that we do not deserve. He will give us mercy. And we will experience his love in ways that we never thought of before. With every head bowed and every eye closed. You can go ahead and sit down. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to hear this wonderful message, this wonderful testimony, Lord, that you've privileged us to hear of my brother, Eric, how you saved him and transformed his life. 
He is now a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. He has taken off the old and put on the new. He confessed his sins to you, Lord, and you forgave him of all of his unrighteousness. And you cast him to the deepest part of the sea. And he can honestly say, who can bring a charge against the elect of God? Who can bring an accusation? No one. For if God is for us, who can be against us? For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And because Christ lives in me, I too shall live with him and for him. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. One more time. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy May the Lord bless you. His face shine upon you. Let's pray for the offering that we're about to receive. My Lord, we give to you what you have given to us. Lord, we will give our tithe to you. Will you bless it, multiply it, and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be blessed. You're dismissed.